Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. It is really good to be with each and every one of you for the first class that we have here in the book of Hebrews. And, you know, Hebrews is an interesting book to study because one of the first things that you always hear about Hebrews, I, I remember I, I actually ran into a church lady that used to go to a congregation that I attended, uh, and it was one of those things where I took a survey of what we should do for the next class, and we decided that we were going to do something textual, so we were going to study as either a, a book or a specific passage, and uh, got a lot of different suggestions, of course, ranging all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and one lady actually voted... This is what her card said, anything but Hebrews. So, <laughs> uh, and I think sometimes we have a little bit of that attitude, and, and I think that that largely comes because Hebrews is hard. Hebrews is a difficult book to study in some ways. First of all, it's very long, and it has a continuous buildup of arguments. So it's kind of like in math class, if you remember back in your high school days, that if you missed a class or two, it was very difficult to get caught up because you missed the thing before and what you're learning now builds on what you missed. And so Hebrews is kind of like that. It's this constant buildup of an argument. And uh, one thing that, granted, I'm not somebody that can read Greek yet. I'm still working on that. Uh, but based on Greek scholars that know far more about this than I do, they say that Hebrews actually has some of the most complicated and beautiful Greek of any book in the New Testament. They say that the level of Greek that is used in Hebrew is unmatched. So literally even the language and the, the style in which it is written, it is written in a complicated way. And that's because the, the arguments themselves are, are crafted sometimes around the, the words and the wordplay that is used in the scripture here. And another thing too that makes Hebrews a little bit of a, a difficult topic of, of study is that you need a baseline understanding of the Levitical laws. And as 21st century Christians that are several thousand years removed from the time when the Levitical laws were pertinent to God's people, that's something that we are definitely not unfamiliar with, but it's something that we don't have the fine-tuned knowledge that a first century Jew, for example, would have had. And the concepts themselves can be kind of challenging. They're, they're very abstract, you're dealing with things that are of a spiritual nature, and so it's a little bit, you have to be able to think more abstractly about some of these concepts than you would, for example, in the narratives of the Gospels or the Book of Acts. And so because of that, you do have to have a, a little bit of a sense of being able to understand things on an abstract level and to be able to think about these concepts in that way. And because of this, Hebrews tends to intimidate people a little bit. But even with all of that said, I want to encourage you that this is not something that should be terribly intimidating. It is true that you tend to get more out of the book of Hebrews if you have some of that background knowledge, but one thing that I've always been impressed about many of the members of the church is a lot of us have studied those things. I, I know that when I'm sitting here, it's, it's pretty common for us to hear sermons from the Old Testament and to understand some of the things from the old law and even some of the things that may not necessarily be technically dealing with, for example, the second half of Exodus or the book of Leviticus, where a lot of these laws that are going to be brought in take place. Hebrews also has a lot of allusions to the more narrative parts of the Old Testament and a lot of prophecy. And there's a lot of, uh, there's several occasions where the Psalms are quoted. And so those passages are a part of it as well. And those are things that we are, we do tend to be more familiar with. And so uh, I know that Hebrews can be a little intimidating, but don't let it intimidate you. It is something that we're going to just kind of walk through it slowly and digest it, and because of that, we can get a lot more out of it in that way. And this is really not so much a note on the book of Hebrews. It's more an, a note on my teaching style. Uh, I'm somebody that likes discussion. I enjoy a back and forth, and so if you have something that you need to say or a concept you don't understand, feel free to raise your hand and uh, maybe speak up if, if need be, if I just don't happen to see you, because this is a wide auditorium and I have to turn a lot. So uh, if that is the case, feel free to speak up and ask questions. I actually really enjoy 
discussion-based classes. So I know that that's a, a little atypical of a auditorium class, but definitely speak up if there's something that you don't quite understand in here. So with the book of Hebrews, I think it's important to understand exactly where we stand on the book of Hebrews and the purpose of the book, because that's really the first thing you need to understand about anything. And of course, that's something that we'll be developing over the next 13 weeks. However, it's sufficient right now to bring up that the overall idea behind the book of Hebrews is that the Hebrew author is writing to Jews that are in danger of falling away. And like I said, we'll develop that more over the course of this, but suffice it to say for right now that he's dealing with Jews that have become Christians. And now they're starting to feel a little bit of a temptation to return to Judaism. And so if we understand the context in which this is taking place, and granted there's a little bit of debate, and we'll get into that in a little bit too, as to when Hebrews was actually written in the date, I want you to put yourself in the mind of a first century Hebrew. And we're probably dealing with a book that was written somewhere about 30, 40-ish years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And a lot of these Jews that he's probably writing to are Jews that may not have actually been present at the crucifixion, may not have been present and seen Jesus resurrected. So with that in mind, what are some of the concerns that a Jew living in this time might have had and why might they be tempted to return to the old law that they were more comfortable with? Okay, yeah, very valid concern for those of you who couldn't hear. Uh, he was saying that they may have really had a desire to go back to the sacrifices because maybe they had sinned and felt a need to sacrifice again. And so that's certainly something that the Hebrew author covers in talking about Christ being the eternal sacrifice. What else might they be have been concerned about? Yeah, I think that that's a, an excellent point and a valid concern. Imagine yourself as a first century Jew who has converted. This is like 30 or 40 years after Jesus is resurrected, so you didn't actually see the resurrection. You didn't actually hear Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount or any of his other great speeches. And so you're not a thousand percent sure in the sense that Peter and Andrew and John would have been. And then you've got this outside pressure from your family and from other people friends, everybody that you've known your whole life, let's say that maybe you're the only one that converted in your family, and it would just, life would be a lot easier if I went back to Judaism. I mean, I think that that's a, a valid concern and the reason that Paul might be giving them a little encouragement, because they are dealing with so much, and they are having so much pressure coming from the outside. And I want you to think about it this way as well. If you are a Jew living in that scenario, not only are you probably one of the very few Jews that have converted at this point in your family and your friend group? You may have had to, as Jesus said, leave father and mother and, and brother behind. Not only that, but you're also a Jew that has been taught your entire life that the Messiah is coming. And when the Messiah comes, Israel is going to be redeemed. Because that's how you've read the Old Testament prophecies your entire life, right? And so what happens if you're a Jew living 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus has been resurrected and all of a sudden you're looking around and going, yeah, most of the Jews aren't actually being redeemed by the Messiah. Most of the Jews are not choosing to follow the Christ. And so because of that, you might be thinking, I don't know, is Jesus really the Messiah? Did, did we misread this? And so that could have some doubt setting in on you as well. Any other thoughts? Right. What Keith was saying there, that's a really big adjustment for somebody that, that came from a Jewish background that has a law that in a lot of ways is very physical and the commands are very clear. Now, I get that this is not an exact one to one comparison, so don't, you know, fly off the handle at me. I'm just making a I'm not making a comparison of degrees here, but it's kind of like what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. And boy, is that relevant in this particular time and day. Uh, after the Soviet Union, there were people that used to be under the thumb of people like Stalin, but because they were, they had this sort of 
anxiety about having all this liberty now. Like, we, we have freedom, and now we're in charge of getting our own food, and the government's not tasked with taking care of us and all of these things. And so uh, that can actually be kind of scary. And in the same way, again, I'm not trying to say that the law of Moses was like being in the USSR. I'm just saying that having that extra liberty and that more spiritual mindset, and okay, now it's not just that I have to refrain from killing somebody. I actually have to make sure that I'm not harboring any hatred in my heart you could actually almost want to go back to that old physical law because it's comfortable, it's what you know, and in a lot of ways, the spiritual law is a lot harder. And so those are some excellent points. I think that we're, we're really sort of digging into why this book was necessary in that day. And I think that the solution to that, which the Hebrew writer is espousing here, the, the reason that he is writing this, is you see a running theme throughout the book, which is Christianity is the superior religion. It's not just superior on the surface. It's not just superior in the sense that it's a better version of Judaism. It is the best possible of all religions. It is the fulfillment of the old law. It's not just that, okay, we have uh, Judaism 2.0 here, it's that this is what Judaism was always pointing to. This was always the purpose of the old law. And the old law only existed to point you towards the new law because it is the perfect plan that God had all along. And so really establishing that and harking on it and, and really repeating himself a lot on that and explaining the different and various ways that that is the case really helps us understand why the book of Hebrews was written. And if we go through this study with that understanding in mind, it will help us better understand several of the smaller passages that we're going to go through. So this brings us in our introduction to this one of the few examples, in fact, the only example in the New Testament that I think that this becomes a very difficult question. And that question is, who wrote it? Because in every other New Testament book, we have a pretty good idea of who wrote it. Hebrews is the one that remains a little bit of a mystery on who was the one that actually wrote it. So there are several candidates that we could bring up. First of all, there's the Apostle Paul. That has been postulated by quite a few people. A lot of people believe that one. Uh, another guess, I guess is the best way to say it, is Barnabas. There have been some people that suggested Barnabas, who is the son of encouragement, of course, is the one who wrote it. Another, uh, an another guess at this is going to be Luke, who wrote Luke-Acts. So they believe that Luke was one of the ones that could have, have written it. Then there's Clement of Rome, who was a, a high and well-known official in the Roman church in the second century. So some people believe that, uh, or, well, first and second century, I should say that as well. So some people believe that Clement of Rome is actually the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. And then finally, Apollos, who we don't have a whole lot of information about, but is mentioned several times in the book of Acts. And also uh, he is at least referenced in a couple of other New Testament books, specifically some of the Pauline epistles. And so we have five candidates here that could have possibly written this book, and we're going to go through each of them and talk about some of the reasons that they may or may not have written this. So first of all, when it comes to Paul, he is the one who most of the early church attributed this book to. So unlike the other Pauline epistles, if this is indeed a Pauline epistle, the book of Hebrews has no introduction. So there is no I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. None of that is at the beginning of Hebrews. Hebrews just kind of starts and, and dives straight in. It's almost like the, the gospel of Mark in that sense, that it, it di dives straight into the action and just keeps going. Uh, so Clement of Alexandria, not to be confused with Clement of Rome, who is one of our other candidates, uh, just like in the Bible, there's people with way too many of the same name. But uh, Clement of Alexandria he believed that Paul wrote it and claimed not only did Paul write it, but that he wrote it in Hebrews. And that Luke, who of course wrote Luke and Acts and was a close associate of Paul, is the one who translated it into Greek. 
And so that's Clement of Alexandria's theory that Paul actually is the author, but Luke is the one who translated it. And because of that, we have the extremely polished and, and refined Greek that we see in Hebrews. Uh, so he, he's just a translator in this sense. And then the protege of Clement of Alexandria, Origen, he also claimed that it was Paul. Now, just to go ahead and head this off at the pass, if you ever get into a discussion about the authorship of Hebrews with a scholar or somebody that is a skeptic, what they normally will do will point to Origen as their proof that Paul did not, in fact, write Hebrews. And this is why. There is a passage where Origen says, as to the authorship of Hebrews, only God knows who actually wrote it. That's a paraphrase, but that's essentially what he said. And so they'll point back to Origen and say, see, Origen, who was an apostolic father, said that he doesn't actually know who wrote Hebrews, and it, it probably wasn't Paul, and he would have known if it was Paul. The only problem with that is it's the same kind of problem that we run into, for example, in Matthew 7, where we look at Matthew 7 and we read, judge not lest you be judged, and every atheist I've ever met, they know that one Bible verse and no others. The problem is they didn't keep reading. That quote from Origen, if you back up just a little bit, Origen actually says that he believes Paul wrote it. He said that he's not 100% sure. It's possible there was another author. And that's why he says, as to the authorship of Hebrews, only God truly knows. But he actually builds a case for Paul being the author of Hebrews, backs it up with evidence and says he believes that Paul is the one that wrote it. So if you ever run into that in a, a, a point of conversation with somebody else, it's virtually universal amongst the early church that Paul is the author of Hebrews. The only contention that we have as to whether or not Paul wrote Hebrews in the early church is one passage by Esubus, who is a little bit later than the guys we're talking about now. And Esubus actually says that there is some contention as to who wrote it. doesn't say that he believes Paul didn't write it. He doesn't say that anybody else that's prominent in the early church didn't write it. All he is saying is there are some people in the church that believe Paul is not the author. But this group, whoever they are, are such a tiny minority that that's the only reference that we ever have to somebody in the early church that does not believe Paul, in fact, wrote this epistle. So, now let's go ahead and dive into some scripture to kind of back this up because there's some scriptural evidence that we can look into as to who wrote it. So I want you to go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and we'll look at a couple of passages here. So first we'll look at Hebrews 13 verse 23. So in Hebrews 13, 23, the author here writes, Know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes, I will see you. So that obviously doesn't tell us who wrote Hebrews, but what it does tell us is that whoever wrote Hebrews is a close associate of Timothy. And who in the early church is associated with Timothy? It's Paul. He even calls him his son in the faith. So does this guarantee that Paul is the one writing this? No, it doesn't. But of all of the people that could have written it, the one that has the closest association to Timothy is indeed Paul. So that is a, a piece of evidence in Paul's favor as to whether or not he actually wrote this. Uh, another piece of evidence is found in the same chapter in Hebrews 13, and now we'll look at verse 18, where the author writes, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. So, in a vacuum, that may not say much about the author, but if you look at the book of Acts, chapter 23, which of course is Luke writing, but it's Paul talking. So, Acts 23, verse 1. I can get there myself. There we go. Uh, now looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life with an entirely good conscience before God up until this day. And then 
we see Paul writing in 2 Timothy. Uh, we'll see him write in chapter 1, verse 3. where Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Now again, this isn't hard proof that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but this concept of a clear conscience and this verbiage that is used in Greek is not super common. And so while it doesn't necessarily prove that Paul wrote it, it is an indication that he is... a it, that he is possibly the author here. So we'll look at, at one more example of this because we could do this all night, but I'm going to just look at one more example from Hebrews 13. So we'll look back at Hebrews 13 and look at verse 19. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you more quickly. So understanding what is being written here, let's also look at... Uh, Philemon 22, because, you know, Philemon just has that one chapter. So let's go ahead and look at Philemon 22, where Paul writes. He says, At the same time, also prepare me a guest room, for I hope through prayers I will be given to you. By the way, the, the verbiage there is the same in the Greek. And so similar phraseology being used there. And then Philippians 1, 24 through 25, Philippians 1, 24 through 25, where Paul writes, Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you through progress with joy and faith. All right, so this theme of Paul wanting to be restored to the people that he cares about, that he loves, this is something that is very common and very much resembles Pauline writing that we see in some of the things that we do know was written by Paul. And so because of that, and because if you read Hebrews 13, it reads very much like one of the salutations that Paul ends his letter with. There is, of course, no salutation at the beginning of Hebrews, but there is at the end. We can learn a couple things about Hebrews. First of all, it says to us that the author could be Paul, but think about the things that we've read in Hebrews 13 so far. Not only does it tell us that, but it also tells us that the book of Hebrews is written to a specific audience. Now, who is that audience? We don't really know because there's not that introduction that we usually have at the beginning of an ep the epistle. It does not say. However, we can be reasonably sure that the addressees were probably Jewish, because why would you use all of this Jewish background and, and use all of this that you would have needed to know the old law to really understand and appreciate and comprehend? And also, why would you worry about Gentiles sliding back into Judaism? That doesn't make sense. And so because of that, we can be reasonably sure that whoever the audience was, they were specific. This isn't a general epistle like First Peter, where he's just writing to anybody, any Christian that might need encouragement. This is specifically written to a group of people because, again, if you're just writing to every Christian, why include the bit about receiving Timothy? That, again, doesn't make sense because, you know, not every Christian is going to receive Timothy. And so this was written to a specific group of people, probably Jewish Christians at a specific time. And so those are some of the things that we can understand about the book of Hebrews uh, just from the little bit that we know here. Another couple of things that have to do with Paul being the possible author. First of all, the Christology is very similar. And by that I mean the, the terms in which he talks about Jesus, talks about his divinity, that sort of thing. Very, very similar in Hebrews and what we see in, for example, Colossians, Romans. These are very similar analogies that he uses. For example, Jesus being the image of God, the agent and sustainer of all creation, uh, a man that is exalted above the angels, the one whose death was a sacrifice for all, all of those things we see in other Pauline writings. Another theme that we see that is consistent with Paul's writing is the two covenants, where he'll talk about the old covenant being a shadow of things to come. We see that in Pauline writings. Uh, we also see um, that the old arrangements and the old parts of the covenant were foreshadowing for things that will come in the new covenant. And so 
Again, we could go on and on about this all night, but the point is there are a lot of telltale signs that Paul is indeed the author. So uh, some of the things that do somewhat weigh against Paul being the author is some people date this book a little bit later than Paul, and so because of that, you know, the earliest date that a lot of people will give is 65, and the reason that that's a problem is because as far as we know from secular history, Paul actually dies in AD 65. And so there is a possibility there that there's not a ton of overlap, but there's also a proof that we've already read about that may be hinting at it. When he talks about being restored to the people, where he's talking about, I have a desire to be restored back into you. Now, maybe he's just talking about meeting up with you again but it sounds more like what he's talking about is that whoever is writing this book is being imprisoned. And of course, we know that Paul famously was imprisoned several times. We know for a fact he was imprisoned at least twice, and possibly a third time that we don't know about in Ephesus as well, although I won't get off into that theory right now uh, for your sakes. But the point in all of this is there are a lot of signs that would indicate that Paul is indeed the author of the book of Hebrews. Then we go on to Barnabas. Now, Barnabas is the only other candidate, other than Paul, that has at least some support in the early church that thinking he might have been the author. And uh, that comes back from one of the apostolic fathers uh, who comes a little bit later. He's not really in that first generation. And he postulated that maybe Barnabas was the author. However, he doesn't really have a lot of evidence to back that up. He basically just makes a guess. There's nothing wrong with speculating but that's really the only thing that we have that makes us believe that maybe Barnabas is a part of it. Now, Luke, another possible candidate, we kind of already talked about why some people believe that Luke could have written it. First of all, the, the Greek that is used in Hebrews is immaculate. It's even better than Paul's usual writings, the other writings that we have from Paul that are written in Greek, which is part of the reason people think that maybe Paul didn't write it is because it's a little bit more polished than we're used to by Paul. However, if the dating is accurate, it's possible that Paul's Greek matured and him writing that at the end of his life explains why the Greek is, is better, or he may have used a scholar that was, was better used in the Greek. You remember that we talked about Origen thinking that maybe Paul actually wrote it, but Luke is the one who translated it? Because of the way that this Greek is polished, that seems unlikely, because even if you have a fantastic translator, some things are going to get lost in translation. And so because of that, the way that this is crafted, most scholars would agree that this was originally composed in Greek, that it was not, in fact, in Hebrew and then translated. Then you have Clement of Rome. So the reason people think Clement of Rome, especially this has become popular recently, the reason that they think that Clement may have been the one to write this is because First Clement, which is a letter that he wrote to the Ephesian church, uses a lot of the same language, a lot of the same ideas, the same concepts. Some of them are actually word for word identical. I mean, they're, they're just quotations. And so we're left with two possible theories on that. Either what Clement was doing was just reciting things from Hebrews, which he wrote, and just using the same concepts, just like preachers do. If you've uh, had a preacher for, for a number of years, you know that sometimes we like to recycle sermons. And so that, that could be what's going on here. But it seems far more likely that what's going on is that Hebrews was already being circulated amongst the church. And so what's actually going on here is Clement is just quoting the book of Hebrews. And if he is quoting Hebrews, and in one quotation he actually says, and scripture says and then the quotation from Hebrews. If that is the case, then what that means is Hebrews was being circulated and it was already seen as authoritative by the early church. So they saw it as scripture, they saw it as authoritative, and it was well known by the early Christians. So that not only helps us understand that what Clement was doing was actually just quoting Hebrews, he's not the actual original author, but on top of that, the original church believed that this was scripture, that it belonged in the canon, that it was the work of the Holy Spirit, and that it was something that they were familiar with and saw as authoritative. And then finally, you have Apollos. Apollos. 
he is the final candidate that people think may have actually written the book of Hebrews. We do know that Apollos was eloquent. And we also know that the Greek in Hebrews is very eloquent. I've just given you a concise summary of all the reasons we think it could have been Apollos. That's really about it. And that's because we don't know a whole lot about Apollos outside what we read in Acts. And we don't really know a whole, body, a whole lot about his writing style because we have no writing that has been preserved for us to compare it to. And so because of that, that's really all we've got. So in light of all this, I've gone through these five candidates. It is true that there are some problems with Paul being the author. There are some things that are difficult to explain if Paul is indeed the person who wrote Hebrews. However, the fact remains that the weight of the evidence lies in Paul's favor. If you're comparing him to any of the other candidates, the evidence that Paul wrote it versus the evidence of anyone else is overwhelming. It seems as though it is very likely that Paul wrote it. But I do want to leave you with one final idea about the authorship. We are used to, because we study the New Testament books as often as we do and should, that it's important that we know the author. And that is correct. That helps give us context. It helps us understand what is being said here. However, that's actually not common in the Old Testament. Of the 27 books of the New Testament, Hebrews is the only one that we're kind of iffy on who the author actually is. But... In the Old Testament, it's more common to not know who the author is. We know who wrote the Pentateuch. That was Moses. We could name the other ones that we know who wrote it. But usually, if you get into like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Esther, Nehemiah, Job, we don't actually know who wrote those. And so that's the more common thing. So isn't it interesting? The book that is the link between the Old and the New Testament is the only New Testament book that we don't know the author of, and that was more common in the Old Testament. I'm not saying that that was planned intentionally, but I do find it very interesting that that shares a commonality with several Old Testament books, and it happens to be the book that references the Old Testament the most. So just some food for thought on that one. A couple other things I wanted to talk about as well. Um, when it comes to... Uh, a couple of other important factors to consider. Beyond authorship, okay, that's just my first bell, right? Okay, that's just my warning. All right, so we'll, we'll cover this quickly then. That, that actually works out well. Um, it's in, always important to know when we're looking through any book and, and looking at its destination, because the destination, just like its authorship, can give us some insights into whether or not, uh, well, essentially just to its purpose. So I do want to read this passage really quickly um, that I'm taking from a, a book by Neil Lightfoot, uh, where he's talking about the destination and the date. He believes that it is not possible for Hebrews to be written after A.D. 70. And the reason that he gives this is that present tenses are used when it's talking about temple worship. And here he says, Present tenses are used by the author as though the temple is still standing and the Levitical offerings are still being made. And he cites several verses, for example, Hebrews 7, 8, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 10, and 13, 10. In all of these instances, the Hebrew author, whoever it is, is using present tense when he talks about the temple worship, which means that maybe he's talking about it sort of retroactively, but it's far more likely that this book is written before the destruction of the temple. Because if that was the case, sacrifices are no longer going on. And so if he's talking about this presently, then we can only surmise that whoever is writing this is doing so at a time where the sacrifices are continuing. And here's another thing to consider. This is a, a kind of a point by omission. Let's say that this was theoretically written after 70 AD that the temple has already been destroyed, the priesthood has been wiped out, the genealogy is gone. Why, in a book talking about the superiority of the Christian faith and how the old things have been wiped away, why would you not mention the destruction of the temple? I mean, that's, a, that's sort of a nail in the coffin argument, isn't it? 
If you're talking about how the old things are a shadow and they've passed away and they've been wiped away and now we have this new covenant, why would you not mention, oh yeah, by the way, uh, the sacrifices are kind of gone now. And all of these things that were tied to the Levitical laws, that's all done away with too. You can't even do the rituals that I'm talking about anymore because Jerusalem has been destroyed. Why would you not mention that? That's a clinching argument. And so it's very, very likely that this book had to have been written before 70 AD. I tend to date it somewhere between 60 and 70 because that's the most likely date. So uh, that gives us a pretty narrow window as into uh, exactly where that is. And if it is written like, you know, in the early hundreds, like a lot of the more liberal scholars will suggest, it doesn't really make sense for you not to mention the temple destruction at the time. And so because of that, it makes far more sense uh, for that to be the case. Another discussion that we can have quickly is, where is this letter written to? Well, again, we don't have a lot of clues other than whoever the recipients are were Jews. And there's been several different destinations that were talked about, but it is most likely that it was one of two places, either Rome or Jerusalem, one of those two. A lot of people think that it was actually written in Rome and sent to Jerusalem. And that's even more plausible if Paul is in fact the author because it happens near the end of his life. Where is Paul near the end of his life? He's in Rome. And being under house arrest for a long time, that gives you a lot of time to write. So it's possible that he is in Rome writing back to the church at Jerusalem and that would have made sense because it's mostly Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem. The only point against Jerusalem is that if you were writing to a group of Jews that their primary language was Aramaic and their secondary language was Hebrew, it seems odd to write it in Greek. Not impossible. Greek was the academic language of the day, so maybe whoever wrote this book is doing so thinking that whoever is going to receive it is going to be able to speak Greek because it's kind of the universal language. Or maybe he's thinking about it long term, that it, I, this book will be best preserved in Greek. And so because of that, he writes in Greek, even though he's writing to a Jewish audience. But this is also one of the reasons that people think that it might actually be the reverse, that whoever is writing this is a Jew living in Jerusalem and sending the letter to Rome. So that's just a couple of possibilities. Either way, I don't think it makes a huge difference in our study because we already know from other indications in the book that this is a primarily Jewish Christian audience. So what city they were living in, I'm not going to say it's irrelevant, but it's not something that, dra that drastically changes the way that we do this study. All right. Um, well, I could go into one other thing here, but I guess I'll just go ahead and ask, are, are there any questions or comments on this before we wrap up this evening? All right. Uh, if not, I guess we'll go ahead and take our break now, and we will start on Chapter 1 next week. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances. <laughs>